Welcome to the Startup Grind. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to invite the two most important persons of this evening, except the uh, Prime Minister, of course, uh, in the name of Xavier Buc and Michael Jackson. I said except. So, if you fray your way through, and if you could get a, another mic, please, another microphone, uh, before both of them are here on the stage, or come on stage, take a seat, I quickly explain you what Startup Grind is about. Startup Grind, like, like First Tuesday, which we started to 15 years ago nearly, yeah, we get gray hair, is the idea is to inflict the virus of entrepreneurship and to promote entrepreneurship and to show by example what you should do, what you can do, what you should not do, but you, what you do anyway. And I mean, if you fail, it's not wrong, but fail fast. So tonight, for this first event, I'm very pleased that two of the people I really look up, not only from the height, <laughs> uh, have accepted to join us tonight for this first Startup Grind. Startup Grind, the format is simple. It's every second month, there is one person who is interviewed. The idea is to show the, what this person has achieved and also to show the person itself that it's not only achievement, but it's also the person, the story which is behind. And that in a standard format, it will be taped, filmed, so behave. And then it will be put online. Afterwards, there's generally networking. But as you will see, it's our first event. And I would like to let, leave the floor to the two, Michael Jackson, who is doing uh, and the, the thing is called a fireside chat. Fireside chat, what is that? In the US, on the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world, in conferences, you don't have any more presentations. You don't have pitches. You don't have panels. But you have a fireside chat. This means. There are two people who are sitting next to each other and they are chatting, eventually having a beer, a whiskey, uh, smoking a cigar or anything else, <laughs> like, like in front of an open fire. And that's why it's called a fireside chat. So put a little bit of cozy of uh, atmosphere and now I hand over to Michael. Uh, yes, and I also do some I also do something which you have never seen me before, uh, taking off my tie, so please. There we are. We have, okay, we have two here. That's great. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's my pleasure to be here, to have the opportunity to have a chat with, with, with Xavier Buk here. Um, we're missing the fire, we're missing the cigars, and we're missing the whiskey. <laughs> but we have at least the people, and we have... Uh, and the women, yeah. No, we have those as women well. Women I'm sorry, I'll have to lean back and look relaxed here. This is good. Okay, welcome. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes. What I, what I hope to do is, is have a chat with, with, with Xavier here and uh, see what's driven him, see how he's become successful, see what words of wisdom he can give to everybody else in the audience and uh, see what we can learn from him. So, uh, I mean, most people know, know you, I think, here, but uh, you've been a very successful Luxembourgish entrepreneur in ICT, started at a young age, you have a successful hosting business, a successful DNS business, and so on. Tell us a bit about all that. Okay, a little bit about me. I started being an entrepreneur straight, straight uh, after school, just a little bit after I went a little bit going to a an, an, uh, company, Telefonie, actually, where I had three years of very nice experience building up a company called Netline. Uh, started, and then I, I decided to, to create a few companies by myself. So I created Data Center Luxembourg. It's a hosting company, a data center backbone and, and co-location service. Afterwards, I got an idea on creating a company around domain names called EuroDNS. We are offering domain names of the entire world, all the domain extensions uh, to the world. That was quite a, a nice uh, a story, especially how, how to achieve, how to reach out to, to gain customers, B2C worldwide. Then afterwards, I, I stayed in the domain name industry and we created a company called Domain Invest. We raised some money to, to buy actually domain name portfolios, high valuable domain names. We consider domain names, high valuable domain names to be actually real estate that you can monetize, where you have traffic on domain names that you can 
uh, either resell or uh, transform all the internet traffic into money, and then we had the opportunity to invest in another company called DomainTools.com. It's a uh, worldwide and a company that is leader in, in the data around domain names, which has a hell lot of internet traffic. And for people who know what Alexa ranking is, it's an Alexa ranking 200. So it's 200 most visited website in the world. Um, and from there on, I continued um, putting up the right people, right teams, and started to invest in a few other companies and helping other young entrepreneurs. So that's a little bit high level, my background. Okay, that's good. But um, before you started all this, you must you, once you were working in a normal company, yes? You were working as a sales guy or whatever, and you became an entrepreneur one day. How, how, how did that happen? What made you take the leap or whatever? Uh, actually, I was being... As a student, I was already entrepreneur. So even at that school, I was uh, already selling a hell lot of things to all my colleagues at school. So I was already <laughs> doing a lot of business back then. Going, stepping out of school, that was actually quite a challenge because actually I stopped university because I, I simply loved much more what I was doing then than uh, becoming an, a banker or somebody and working for Luxembourg State. I, I, I wasn't seeing myself into those shoes, so I decided to quit actually university, and that was already quite a challenge to, to tell my parents that, that I was going to, to stop university, especially here in Luxembourg when you have all your cousins, all your, bro your brother, and so having university diploma, and you come in and say, last little black duck coming, well, guys, I, I'm stopping, so that was quite a challenge, but it was somehow emancipating and somehow also being a start to to believe in myself. And there I first started actually a company, so before working, and it was, but it stayed small. So I, I immediately started a first company, back then it was called uh, Multisoft, and actually the notary had written <laughs> Microsoft, <laughs> so I came to the notary <laughs> and I told him, no, sorry, I'm not founding Microsoft. <laughs> that was a little side joke. And and I did that for just for, for one year, and I realized that I was going nowhere was still profitable but I did my money okay but absolutely was was lacking the growth and experience and just around the same time a um, company came around and that was Telefony and they wanted to start the internet business and were looking for somebody understanding internet back then that was in 97 so in 97 Luxembourg didn't have much people understanding a little bit internet and so I joined them and said okay let's let's build this company actually helped them even do the roadshow because they even went for external investors. And that company had 4,000 really interesting customers in Luxembourg, even from ministries all over the place. So, and they had great structured team. And so I, I really piggybacked on, on that knowledge and experience and how they were structured and learned quite a lot there. And after three years, I decided, okay, now I have built up something for somebody else. And uh, now let's, let's do it for myself. So when you decided to do it for yourself, that must have been a big leap. You, you had to give up your job and a steady income, I guess, and stuff like that. What did your family say? What did your... Yes. So I, wa I was young. So I had no, I was not married. I had no kids. So definitely that helps um, to do that. It would be much harder to do if I had the responsibilities of, of a family. And also... It, it didn't come from one day to the other. So when you prepare to do your your first startup, you 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 build you look at the pieces of uh, of the puzzle that you need to achieve to be successful. So you you reach out, you you have your idea challenged, you try to find partners that would join you, you try to look up on investors uh, if they would follow you, you already uh, try to get some customers that would follow you. So. Well, everything was lined up and prepared before I, I, I did the jump. Okay. Well, that's good. The preparation was there at least. But we're here at something called Startup Grind tonight, and startup is always exciting these days. If it's in the TV and we have you know, billionaires and private jets and people on the TV talking about startups all the time. But the other word here is startup grind. Grind, as you know in English, it means grind. It's hard work. It's... It's it's day to day. It's boring. It's many tedious things. What well, what was hard in all of this stuff that you did? What was the hardest thing you had to do? 
the work itself is not hard. When you are passionate, when you like, when you are decided to go for it, you, the hours simply fly by. So you definitely, back then, uh, 70, 80 hours a week was absolutely normal. But but you don't see it. They don't. You don't feel it. So the hard things are always uh, the most unexpected things. So you, when you build a startup, you you wait the risks, the pros and the contrasts, and whenever you, you decide to go with the next step. And, uh, and, and based on those risks and, and, and how much risk you are ready to take, you, 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 put your up, you, you put that, confront that to your goals. So actually the hard things is able to push your goals further and be able to, f to bring up and follow up all, all the rest of the elements that you need to to achieve the new goals. So actually, th the way how you could limit yourself is actually, and how you can you surpass yourself is actually the hard thing. The rest is as long as you like and what you do, it's it's easy. So being self-motivating is a really important thing in this, I guess. Oh yeah, definitely. So you should, uh, whenever you do a startup and you you launch yourself as an entrepreneur, you should be passionate about it. You should believe in it, what you do, and. Uh, you shouldn't start it just f for the money. The money comes along whenever you, you are successful and you are happy in doing what you do. Luck must come into it a little bit. People talk about this guy's always lucky or, or something. Have you been lucky? Uh, definitely, probably. But I would see luck. Luck for me is everything, all the things you cannot influence. So for me, luck is actually to be alive or to have healthy children. That's that's for me luck. I cannot. That's the things I cannot really influence. But but all the decisions and opportunities that are presented to you during a, a life cycle of entrepreneurship are actually results of former decisions and opportunities that you already took and that present to yourself again. So it's always taking the right decisions, the right opportunity, which one to follow, which one not to follow, and I'm not sure if that's luck by choosing the good one, if you can call that luck. But, yeah. So it sounds very analytical, anyway. You, you sound yeah. very structured, very I analytical in all of this. A lot of people t tell me that I'm a very analytic guy, absolutely. Okay, so you, w was there a moment in all of your well, life stories so far where it was all beginning to work out, where you thought, kind of, hell yes, this is, this is going great? Or are you not satisfied yet, or, or what? Uh, yes, so satisfaction is every time i able to, to, to push the limits and go to the next steps. That's, that's where every time is satisfaction comes, when you see, uh, well, I, I, I managed to overcome a certain limit again, and I can go over to the, to the next level. Okay, so well, let's move on to one of your new projects then, or one, something you've been involved with. The, the project Mega by, by Kim.com is, is a new project which many of us have heard about. If, if you haven't, you know, well, maybe you can talk a bit about Kim, how you met, got to meet him, and and this project and what it means for Luxembourg as well, because it's quite interesting for the Luxembourgish context. Actually, that's, that's a good example of showing if luck or not luck. Is it, is it luck to have gotten the opportunity to, to be faced to a project like Mega? So for the people who don't know what Mega is, it's a, it's a cloud storage that allows a little bit like Dropbox, uh, but where actually is a your computer and your iPad, your iPhone does the encryption. So it's user-controlled encryption. The c encryption key is only on your side. And all the data that is pushed to the cloud leaves your computer encrypted. And the provider in the middle does not have any key to decrypt it. So it's really data protection and your data is very secure. The controversial part of it is that the person who launched that and very successfully is a certain Kim.com who got shot down, shut down by the US for his for former project Mega Upload where he had something similar but what a lot of people used to share movies. So when telephone rang I had my friend on the phone, his name is Tony, he is in, uh, in New Zealand and he's a good friend of mine because actually he's a a competitor of EuroDNS is doing the same business that I'm doing at EuroDNS, but he's doing that on the other side of the world and going through conferences throughout the world. Of course, we got to, to meet each other. We, we got friends. And he called me up and said, well, I'm sitting here next to Kim.com and he needs servers in Europe. He definitely doesn't want to put servers in the US anymore. He learned a lesson there. And so 
And I was there, I said, okay. I was just reading the news and everybody else. So I was quite skeptical. So I, I, I listened to what Kim had to say, what he was going to launch. And um, this, this concept of encryption, that, that the encryption and the data that you put in the cloud should be entirely under your control and that the data should be encrypted, I immediately understood. And I also understood the, the potential, while on the one side challenging, but on the other side, the potential and the opportunity to have a person like him that is so controversial launching that would simply get the, the, the press coverage. And, and now today, when you launch a business in internet, the hardest part of launching a business internet is to get the coverage and the visibility. On day one, when you launch a business, Google has not indexed you, nobody knows you. So that's, that's the hardest part in launching an internet business. So I said, mm, so this, this project is interesting because the hardest part is covered. You have the guy who will get the coverage of worldwide media and the technology sounds good. So I decide, okay, I take the plane. Two weeks later, I was in New Zealand and I was meeting uh, Kim. And um, what convinced me was when I saw the team behind. The team behind is, is just fantastic. Kim is very good at being what he is, very controversial, a lot big mouths, a lot in the press, very good at that. But the technical team behind, and especially a guy called Matthias, another one called Bram, are just uh, IT genius where I've never seen, and I have seen many of them. And they showed me what they have developed and also their long long term plan. So right now I just explained it's a Dropbox uh, equivalent, which is very successful. We have 25,000 new users a day signing up since last January. So it's uh, we are now over 8 million users and it's growing like hell. And uh, and the next step, which will also be now publicly available, I think in one, two months, will be encrypted chat and also encrypted voice calls and video calls. That's Michael here who likes who is <laughs> history Skype will <laughs> not like that very much, but let's see. Our our goal is to be the Skype killer. Let's see what if we manage to do that or not. <laughs> so. that's, a, that's actually quite funny because it's exactly the same story that, that that you have as I have with with with, with the Skype guys. Was they had previously a project running um, Kazaa, the file sharing network, which was effectively closed down because of the music industry, just like Kim. They had a fantastic technical team and they built from that a product that promised uh, encryption and privacy and, and isolation from national authorities and all of these sort of things. It's, it's, it's kind of a copy, which is, uh, kind of, which, is, which is pretty funny, actually. So let's hope there can be a second success for Luxembourg in that. Yeah, so so I, I, was, I got convinced by the quality of the team and when you create a startup, it's, it's anyway, it's very often the quality of the team and the quality of the people that you're able to get around you that, that makes a difference. And so I decided, okay, I will help these guys. I will help them build the servers. And, and um, it, actually, I even invested in the company and um, got even friendship. So it's very strong uh, uh, bond. And so we, at the beginning, we didn't put servers in Luxembourg directly um, it's because of the controversial and we were not sure how the service would be perceived in the world. Will it be seen again as a mega upload or will it be accepted as being as a, a Dropbox? So, and, and Luxembourg, I even went to Luxembourg government ministries and we all agreed together, okay, let's at least wait a few months to see how, how it comes up and how the image is. And then luckily what happened, we all know what happened, then came Mr. Snowden and the NSA story. Then bingo. Now the bad guys were US and the good guys were the people encrypting data and, and protecting data privacy. So then that, that was the go. And, and meanwhile, anyway, the service was seen as, as being a Dropbox light service. So what we did is we started really building up servers in Luxembourg and, uh, and meanwhile we are adding a rack full of servers per week uh, for just, just for Mega. So it's, um, it's a fantastic story. It's good for the bandwidth of Luxembourg, for the data centers in Luxembourg. Bandwidth-wise, we have a triple the Luxembourg capacity nearly in, in no time. So, and it's, it's continuing. Oh, well, that's great. Anyway, so th these businesses, some of your businesses, have all needed funding, and many of the people here who are contemplating businesses need the funding. How's the funding process been for you through your, through your life? Tortuous? Easy? 
<laughs> torture is at the beginning. And whenever you start your first startup, it's really a hell. So uh, trying to fund, fund, find money. Um, we were lucky that one of the partners, so I, when I started Data Center Luxembourg in 2000, I, I built a strong team around me. I had a very good sales guy. I had another guy that was very good in communication. He actually was working for a newspaper. And I had an older guy, gray, gray hair, we called him back then, who was our financial advisor and who also had the relationships to, to people with money. So that was enough. And we put our first money, own money on the table. So that was enough to, to launch, kick, kick off our first uh, startup with our own money and then a little bit friends and family. So friends and family is still the way to go whenever you start your, your first startup. We were lucky that one year later we needed to invest some money into infrastructure, so we went to the banks. And thanks again to experienced people uh, in that were co-founders of ours, the bank actually, we never thought they would, they, they gave us an, 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 a loan back then, actually on even without signing personal guarantees. So that's nowadays, that was in 2000, nowadays it's nearly impossible. But actually only on the, how we call it, Fonds de Commerce, we got, we got the loan. So we were, that's quite lucky, that there is something we can call luck, but it's a relationship with your banker that, that, makes, it, uh, that makes a difference there. And then the next companies were easier and easier, and uh, I, I can say that I, I did all type of, huh? so I invest, I, I got raised money from private high network individuals, um, with, that was with EuroDNS actually, with EuroDNS that was in 2004, that's what I did I had the first external investor that we found. That was a very nice experience. And, uh, and after that, then things get easier and easier. What more success is you can show, the easier it is, of course. And uh, the next step was then going to VCs. We did that with, um, with Domain Invest. With Domain Invest, we raised nearly 20 million, so that's quite a lot of money. And, uh, and we did it with VCs and a lot of high network individuals. I think we even have like 45 of those. And we, we went to, we did road shows, we did, went Paris to, to London, to Brussels. And uh, quite strangely, luck, Brussels was our best, best field where we got a lot of um, network individuals. And, um, and uh, some VCs, we got VC from Paris and the Luxembourg VCs. We got SNCI also to, to join and um, that, that was successful. And then, and then I... That's, that's it when I was raising money. Then it went on. But you never tried to raise in the United States or go to Silicon Valley or any of these things? No, I never did. And actually when the time from Domain Invest came, we asked ourselves a question that we should. And uh, actually some investors that already signed up and were going to said, us, said to us, better don't. <laughs> Try not to. Because the liability side on, on, on having uh, US investors on it would give you much bigger exposure. Whenever you get sued by a US investor, he can pretend to sue you in the US. And we all know what that ha means in, in, in versus when it comes to amounts of compensation whenever you would lose. So, so we followed that advice and we said, no, let's better stick than to European ones. So with a good business and a good team, it was easy to raise money in Europe. Well, not easy, but, uh, but possible. Especially with Domain Invest, that was in 2008. So that was right the period where the crisis started. So, and we still managed to, but it took us one and a half year to raise uh, 20 million. You're, okay, changing again the subject a bit. You're from Luxembourg. You're president of the ICT cluster here, which is, which is great for everybody. But if you're starting up today as a business, I mean, everybody says, go to Silicon Valley, go to London, go to Berlin, go to Singapore, I, I don't know where. Uh, what, what should we be doing here in Luxembourg? Why should people be coming here to, to, to be starting their business? Good question. <laughs> <No>. Maybe <laughs> they shouldn't. Maybe they should be going there. What's no. the advice? No, the advice, if, if you want to launch a business and... Uh, depending your budget. There, there are definitely cheaper ways to start a business by simply doing an LTD out of London than to do it out of, of Luxembourg. Because uh, simply it's like to go to the notary, to open a bank account, to have a lawyer. And so you, you eat 50 to 80% 50 to 80 if your startup capital is already gone setting up the company. So, but on the other hand, so if you are really a very small company, you don't have much money, Actually, try first to build your business case. But once you're going for something a little bit stronger, bigger, where you have investors, 
doing out of Luxembourg helps helps to get investors to show a stability, and and it also helps for on on the B two C side at least on in internet side to to find the right employees who can cover all the languages that you will if you address multiple countries you want to address the French market German market and UK market then it makes sense to do it out of Luxembourg. All the other aspects for a startup. I could now start listing all the advantages that I would list by being the ICT cluster president, saying that the data centers are great, that electricity is cheap, that bandwidth is cheap, but all that aspect for a small startup doesn't mean much at, at that moment because the cost side, that has no impact. But if you look at what will happen if you are becoming successful and once you, your goal is to be big, then Luxembourg, having starting out of Luxembourg is a big advantage, especially on the legal framework around e-commerce also and the close ways to the ministries and, and, and around the, the e-commerce and, and the legal framework is becomes very important. At EuroDNS, for example, uh, all the terms and conditions and everything around e-commerce protects us a lot. We manage to have customers, over 300,000 customers throughout the world and it, it happens that some customers sued us, actually, a few times. But because of the terms and conditions and because of the strong e-commerce laws, they had to come and sue us in Luxembourg. And, and, and simply, it was, we were always in our right. It was always very strong. We, we never lost. And it, it, it helped us to, to protect our business being out of Luxembourg. So that's, that's just the, the legal side of it. It doesn't mean, though, the more I create businesses and the more I invest in businesses, it doesn't mean... At the beginning, I did everything out of Luxembourg. But now when you have a startup, you could be flexible. You can have the heart of it in Luxembourg controlling, having the, your back covered by Luxembourg. But you could have some developers throughout the world. You could have some support uh, people out of the world. You could be flexible in future. So I'm not saying everything must be Luxembourg. Look, look at it as an, especially in the internet world, as, as being flexible and, and doing the necessary thing. But you will end up really loving Luxembourg and doing business out of Luxembourg. Well, we'll take a couple of questions. I've got one more quote after this question, and then we'll have a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll finish off, I think. Um, I, I just wanted to know, can you get the people here, the technology people in Luxembourg, to satisfy the fast-growing startup in the financial sector, for example, that we see, uh, see these days? You mean finding the, the resource, yeah. human, human yes, resources? Human resource, yeah. You have to go and, and, and bring them in, the, the real good guys. So I'd also try to, to tell to people is that in internet, being good is not good enough. You have to be excellent. You have to go for the best of the best. So we definitely, in the, in the last time, we, we go and we hunt internationally to get the best guys. But that's, that's for the top level. And then you can still... Find a lot, and you also find there are still some good guys coming out of school. I'm not saying that uh, at all. But when you are on an international field and you have to compete with the international, with all all the strong guys internationally, you have to go really for the best of the best. And we we had hunt international, and we bring, but we bring it back to Luxembourg, and it's actually not that difficult to bring it back in Luxembourg, especially if it's families with kids. The very young guys, they look at Luxembourg and say, what, what I'm doing in the evening in Luxembourg, what, what I'm doing here. And, and the weather, look at that weather, what, why am I coming here? But, but still, it's not that difficult at all. And also, when you bring them to Luxembourg, also the salary side of it, it's, it's mostly attractive to them. Okay, that's good. Uh, any questions from the audience? Steve's got one question. and A one, oh, one question. There was the first hand. Does. So I think that it's a good thing and a bad thing. So I think we should do a mix of both. So we should definitely allow, because we, uh, the young startups that come to Luxembourg or want to come or, or want to, or somebody want to start a company often have the chicken-egg problem. So they cannot find an investor until they have a vehicle, but they don't have the vehicle because they don't have the money. So, so somewhere to have the one euro startup, I think is a good idea simply to have a vehicle for, for, for investors to come in. But uh, what I'm always saying, mostly even, even a startup guy, somebody, an entrepreneur who wants to start a startup and is not able to find 12,500 euro, then he will not be able to do anything else either. So if you're not able to, to have that challenge, how can you expect solving all the other challenges that you will have to face? 
tests, which are much, much harder to solve than this 12,500 euro. Okay, that's great. Just one word of advice then to anybody here starting a, a life of hardship with no money and permanent worries. Uh, what would you say to these guys? <laughs> If you have a dream, you are passionate about it, then you f will find means and ways to, to achieve it. So that's and, and, and follow it. Of course, when you have families or so, you have also to, to take into weight that, but uh, simply go for it. You only have one life, it's a short one, so go for it. Oh well, we wish you a long life. Anyway, thank you for this evening. Welcome to the Startup Grind.